So hello and welcome to the Lewis Nichols Show. And I'm really excited to, uh, well, bring you back on the show, Mr. Tony Hadley in Cheltenham. How are and you? hopefully we've got no technical problems, unlike the time we tried <laughs> to do a Zoom. Yeah, so I've, I've did literally just rolled out of the um, of the delivery vehicle, the vehicle that delivers me here. So oh, you're missing your jacket. You're so right. I mean, yeah, I've <laughs> left it somewhere. I don't know. How you been anyway? You're well, right. really good. And last time I spoke to you, I described your voice as liquid gold, which you seem to really like. And I said what? it's just like liquid gold running in the tap because you've got such a distinctive voice. And you seem it to is. really like that compliment. Well, yeah, no, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's nice to get a compliment. I mean. Um, I mean, it, the, the weird thing is that everybody thinks that people in the music business were all supremely confident, um, and you're not, you know, most of the time you are because you have to go on stage and you perform, but you always get sort of, you know, there's, there's, there's times when you think, oh, am I, am I sounding quite right? And I, I think the thing is about being a musician, um, or any, anything in the arts, you want to do it better and better every time. So every time I sing a song, I want to sing it better the next time, whether it's yeah. True Gold, whatever it might be, one of the new songs. I'm always checking myself all the time. So I'm never entirely happy. I make an album and I'm thinking, I could make a better one. Yeah, <laughs> so, always on and that's that. sort of what spur, spurs you on. So, a bit of <laughs> I, well, do you know, there's some people that you listen to <clears> and over time you think, but you thank know, they, you, don't, anyway. they don't sound as good as they once did. But you're up there for me with Tom Jones and the people that voices just doesn't seem to to age they get stronger with soul and, uh, and power well thank you i mean i know tom and he's 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 amazing i mean he really is and uh he's 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 a, he's a great rock raconteur as well he's got some great stories uh, but he's brilliant but he keeps his voice oiled up because yeah. he uses it all the time i mean i'm a big big fan of jack jones um not a lot not a lot of people know who jack jones are in this country but he's a he's an amazing singer uh and then tony bennett we went to see um uh just before lockdown and he's still I mean, he's about 92 93 but he was still wow. singing and still loving it and they had a picture taken with him and everything and it was so lovely to meet him because he's, he's that absolute legend and i think all those kind of classic singers if you like to, to continue to use your voice all the time and during lockdown i mean i was singing all the time i'd be driving around the car in buckinghamshire and wailing away and <laughs> But doing also stuff into my camera that was gaffer taped onto a bit of driftwood, and uh, yeah, so you you got you just got to keep using it all the time. And touch wood, oh well, uh, <laughs> touch wood, it still works. Well, you've done it. That four, well, we're going to say you're here because you're actually celebrating 40 years in the music industry, which is just yeah. incredible. Because some people you get maybe five or six years of success and then you kind of go on to other things but with you you you've had these opportunities that keep coming forward whether it's the 80s kind of festivals or the reunions with I, I just won't give up <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, you're just not going to get rid of me but also I, but I do say to people I'm not remotely qualified to do anything else I mean a heating engineer I couldn't do that you know so singing so I, I so singing's my thing and I, I love writing I love recording and We've got the new single out now because of you. Albums will be finished, hopefully, within the next couple of months in between touring. Um, and I just love what I do. You know, wh when you're a kid, you know, you watch your heroes on top of the pops and then you get to meet your heroes, which is amazing. But in between times, you've signed a record deal. You're having success yourself. And it's every, you know, if that is within you and that yeah. dream is within you, and if you finally make it, you never want to let go of it. And, and that's the thing, I've always, I've had ups and downs, I've played Wembley and I've played clubs and all sorts of things, but sometimes that makes you a better singer as well. You know, you have to go through the mill a few times, uh, you know, in terms of career, in terms of sort of personal emotions and relationships and stuff, so that makes you a better singer. You mentioned just then that um, you've had opportunities where you kind of had inspirations when you were growing up, but then you get to meet them and, and work with them. Who are those people? So who have you before, kind of when you were growing up, looked up to, but then had the opportunity to meet or even work with? Where do you want to start? <laughs> Any of them. I, I, uh, Queen, Freddie Mercury. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. just one of the nicest blokes. The whole band, fantastic. Got to sing with Freddie in Auckland, in New Zealand. He was such a lovely man. And um, meeting people like Elton John, yeah. Rod Stewart, Brian Ferry, Daryl Horn, John Oates, uh, just, you know, the Toto guys, the Kiss guys, Alice Cooper, James Brown, Joe, wow. um, uh, Joe Cocker. I mean, just so many people over the years that I've met. 
uh, Dave Gilmore, you know, Pete Floyd and yeah. Nick Mason and stuff. So, you know, but then also from the younger bands of the Scat and for Girls, guys are brilliant and Ricky and all the boys from um, Kaiser Chiefs, amazing. So I think if you like music, you get a kick out of meeting all these other yeah. people. But don't get three lead singers in a room because it's a really boring <laughs> concert. How's your voice? Oh, it's, a bit, it's a bit tickly. I think I might need some medicine. Um, no, I mean, it, it's, um, if, if you love music, it's great just meeting other people. And uh, I mean, there's so many. And uh, I still, you know, I, I, you know, doing when we did, for instance, Live Aid yeah. uh, at Wembley, I mean, that was, you know, Paul McCartney. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Phil Collins on it. Just incredible. George Michael, late George Michael, you know, great guy, lovely, lovely man. And, and there's so many artists that I've met over the years. And I still look back, or, or even now, if we bump into each other, uh, it's still, it's just a nice feeling. And to know that, that you've all gone through the mill and you're, you're still surviving. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned Live Aid, though, and obviously people from all ages mm. know Live Aid. Uh, they have the same appreciation, but yeah. just kind of how well it was, the names. You mentioned Queen. You know, you, you watch it back and you think you're never going to get a concert like this ever again. But when you were asked to, to take part initially, did you ever anticipate that it was going to be the huge kind of phenomenon that it became? No, not in a million years. I mean, it was, it was literally, I think it was... Um Steve and Gary Martin bumped into Bob Geldof down the, uh, down the King's Road and he said, look, you know, there's this big famine going on in Ethiopia, which, which the general public wasn't really aware of at the time. And he said, look, I, I really want to put something together. I think we can could, we could do something about this. And so that led to Band Aid, the single. And we just turned up down the studio and there was everybody there. And he, oh, hi, how are you? The Quo boys, keeping us entertained, absolutely fantastic, so funny. And uh, it, was, it was a custard cream and a cup of tea. And we'd all join in and sing the song. I don't think any of us realised that it was, would go to number one. Certainly that it would lead to Live yeah. Aid and Philadelphia. And I mean, you know, wow, I mean, just incredible what it created. And I've always said that that was the beginning of what we know today as kind of the, the modern, the telephones and everything else. That was, chat, that was the kind of birth of you know, you know, worldwide charity, if you yeah. like. And, um, and quite amazingly, a, a, a bunch of, you know, a bunch of pop people managed to put it off. It's incredible. It, it was I get incredible, goosebumps yeah. when I watch it back. Just, it was the crowd's reaction as well, when you hear that kind of uh, ovation from the crowd. I mean, what's that like for you as an artist when you walk out and you hear that Terrifying. eruption? Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, the thing is, what you, what you didn't want to happen on that particular day, you thought, this, is, this, is, this was cutting edge technology, I mean, satellite technology. Yeah. Thought, if a cloud comes over that satellite, we're lost, we're doomed, you know. But it was just because, you know, there was 80,000 people there, the world was watching Prince Diana, Prince Charles, all the dignitaries and everything else, and you just wanted to do the best possible performance. Um, you just didn't want to muck it up. Um, and, and I always get nervous before I go on stage. I'll, I'll be nervous before I go on stage tonight, no doubt about that. And I was particularly nervous on that day. And like all great events, it, it just went. Yeah. And asked me to remember most of it, and I, I'm afraid I can't. Um, there are bits of it, elements of it. But I remember sitting in, we went to Legends afterwards, and there was loads of artists just sitting around. Uh, I remember talking to Brian Mann, saying, how are you? And he said, I'm absolutely knackered. He said, because it was such an emotional event. Yeah. But it, it, it just, we were all sitting there and everyone's thinking, oh, I bet you'll be partying afterwards. And we weren't, we were all just mentally drained because it was such an eventful day. No, so I, we've got to talk about Spandau Ballet. I mean, yeah. my parents absolutely loved so Spandau Ballet. <laughs> <laughs> so did all our parents, you know. That was the but how, how did you actually start off together as a group? Did you, were you go into the same college? Were you friends? Like how did Spandau become Spandau We Ballet? started at school. Um, I, I never had uh, the courage to go into school musicals or anything like that. And although I wanted to sing, originally I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, not good enough at the maths for that, but uh, there you go. <laughs> then I discovered music, and we used to go to Pontins Holiday Camp, my mum and yeah. dad and brother and sister and staff and friends and family. So I started singing at Pontins Holiday Camp, and then I was 16, uh, and we formed the band at school. There was, the original lineup was myself, 
Steve Norman, Gary Kemp, John Keeble, and our first bass player, Michael Ellison, who, funny enough, I spoke to just a few weeks ago. And we were with Roots, we were the Cut, we were the Makers. Uh, Richie Miller joined us when we were the, I think we were the Makers, or were we the Cut? I can't remember. Many years ago. And then eventually Martin joined us when we became Gentry. Then we nearly disbanded, discovered a synthesizer, and the rest is all history. We signed a first record deal in 1980. And when you go back to 1980 and you sign your first record deal, how, uh, as a group, did you kind of feel? Because you, you said you had yeah. loads of different uh, names for the band before you, you really got started. That must have been one of those moments where you all look at each other and think, we're, we're actually doing this now, we're, we're going straight ahead with this. Yeah, well, I mean, when you form a band, I mean, you, you know, we, we did it because we loved music, but we had supreme confidence, actually. We all thought we, you know, we, were, we weren't the best musicians in the world, but we were pretty good. And as the band started to develop, we sort of, and then we started playing clubs and we got into the whole punk thing as well. I love punk, punk was amazing. And, um, you know, we played the Roxy in Neil Street, the Hope and Anchor in Upper Street, it just, just incredible. And so we then started to think, wow, actually, we are pretty good and yeah. we hopefully one day we'll sign a record deal. But it took four years, it took four years and a lot of pubs and clubs to get there. So when you, when you finally get there, it's the most euphoric feeling. You're thinking, yeah, brilliant. And then all you do is worry. Because <laughs> the first hit single, well, the first single went to number five, to cut a long story short. The second one was, was it, it was Paint Me Down, which went to number 17. And because we weren't exactly the flavor of the month with some of the, uh, the, the sort of, the kind of rock magazines, the, the knives were already out. They were sort of instantly thinking, oh yeah, I told you they're only gonna be one hit wonders. So you do constantly worry about where your next hit's gonna come from. And then of course, you got your number one uh, after a lot of work. Now that moment, because yeah. nowadays I feel getting a number one's a great thing, but it, it's slightly easier in the sense of you've got Spotify and all these other uh, avenues. But back in the 80s, you had to sell a lot of physical copies. You had to go into the shop, pick it up uh, for it to yeah. count. So it, it was a hard thing to do. So can you remember getting that call or how, I don't know how it worked for you, that you, they said, do you know what? You're number one. Well, I, well number one, I didn't, <laughs> number one, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was a single because up until that point, we'd been sort of a kind of cutting edge, kind of yeah. cult band, very synth oriented. So the true, the whole true album was a complete departure for us. And it was a ballad, and you know, really? But it was, it was actually, um, I was Radio One, um, Simon Bates, who played it when DJs could play the, you know, just play whatever they wanted kind of thing. And he said, the new Spanner Ballet album's out. Ah, oh, it's brilliant, this is the title track. And then he said, this is so good, I'm gonna play it again. So he played it twi you know, twice, amazing. So if Simon Bates says it's gonna be number one, it's gonna be number one. And it was. Um, we, I think we were in Nottingham, and I was asleep as usual because <laughs> lead singers always tend to sleep a lot. And uh, I remember it was, I think it was Steve, Steve well, the rest of the band came in, literally champagne <laughs> all over the room and everything. And, and I remember we had breakfast, and I had scrambled eggs and smoked salmon. I've never had that before, but it was a celebratory, uh, you know, breakfast for being at number one. So it was uh, just amazing. I mean, you, you, you dream of it, but yeah. you don't, not, not, not necessarily everybody gets there. So we were, we're very lucky. And do you know what amazes me? That gold wasn't number one. I, I think it was number two. Number two. That, that's crazy, because for me, that's my go-to karaoke song, along with many other people in that's this country. That's a massive student song. I mean, it, I know I've got so many n nephews and nieces and stuff. And they say, when we're in the, uh, the student bar, you know, gold! I mean, they, all, they can all vouch for this here. There you go. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you know. So, so a lot of people, so a lot of you guys won't necessarily know who I am or who the band are, but they'll know the who, what the song. And um, yeah, I, I, who, no, who knows? I think there was a bit of politics going on at the time. I'm not quite entirely sure as, as to what was going on, but um, but it, it's it's become the you know gold has become the kind of the football anthem. That's the one where I go, yeah. come on then. <laughs> Actually, most of the songs I could just go, come on. But I enjoy singing, so I sing most of them. But you know, that one's, everyone joins in on that one, so it's, it's kind of cool. And we didn't do it at Live 8. I know, That's I saw, the yeah. the stupidest. I saw. Uh, I don't know why, don't know why, I really don't. 
Um, one thing, obviously, with Spandau Ballet, you were at the, the height, you know, in, in regards to fame and success, but then announced that the band was splitting, which, I, you know, from reading reports, it shocked a lot of people. What was the main was reason? Was this the first that? split? The first split. <laughs> the, the first one. Both shocked people. Uh, but I mean, the, the first one back then, uh, was it the 90s? Yeah, it was 19, I think it was 19, around right about 1990. We were making an album called Heart Like a Sky and a uh, terrible time awful and um and myself and john the drummer i i felt that we needed to get out because relationships change in bands and outside influences yeah. affect people in different ways and i just i think myself and john thought that we we needed to get away abroad residential somewhere where you know you, you're concentrating on the music cracking a few beers afterwards getting that kind of band camaraderie back again uh that didn't happen the rest of the guys wanted to make it in London. And I said at the time, I said, if we do it in London, it's going to take months and cost a fortune. And it did. Yeah. And it, to be honest, I think it's not one of our best albums, certainly not. Um, but it, it got to the point where I think to, it, to do music, you've got to enjoy it. You've got to really want to do it. I mean, there's nothing worse than seeing someone go through the motions. And that's, the fans can see that. Everybody can feel that. You know, you've got to love music, and um, and I didn't really love making that album, <laughs> and the tour was a bit fractious too. So, we just kind of felt that it, we sort of drift, drifted away, really. And obviously, during those years, you you went on to do your solo career, and the the guys went on to do some acting and things like that. But I mean, publicly, you you know, it's fair to say there were some broken relationships within the band, and then <laughs> just all these the years, dad. I mean, a lot of it to to do with royalties, <clears throat> and then in two thousand and nine the band came back together. Mm. Was that difficult for you? Because so much had happened previously with broken yeah. relationships. I can't imagine what that's like to kind of just go back in and, hey guys, you know, we're here, let's do well, this. Well, it didn't sort of happen like, it didn't happen like that. Yeah. It wasn't a kind of, um, oh, hello, nice to meet you, you know. <laughs> um, it, was, it was John Keeble that had tried to sort of, actually Shane Ritchie, actually, now that's what it was. So myself and Shane Ritchie was working for Virgin Radio. I was doing a bit for Virgin as well. And he's a massive fan of fan and one of my best mates. And he said, come on, time runs a bang. And just to shut him up, I said, yeah, we'll get back next year. Yeah. And then it ended up on the news and um, it got reported all around the world. And it was like, oh no, I, I didn't mean it. I was only joking. And, um, and it, was, you know, it was John Keeble actually said, look, you know, the fans really want this. And I said, I, I don't know if I can do it. So it took six months of sort of angst and deliberation as to whether I could actually do it. And eventually we managed to get it together. And I'm glad we did because it, you know, it's never the same. Yeah. You know, I mean, you get married to someone, you divorce, you get back together, it's probably never going to be exactly the same. It's a different type of relationship. Um, but I'm glad we did it because we buried a lot of bad feeling. And um, at least, you know, at least we were together, the fans were happy, and uh, we, had, we had a good time, we had some good times, yeah. And then you, you did split again uh, in 2017. Nobody to this day really knows why. No. Uh, uh, and I, I know that Spandau, now, uh, Spandau, the other members, say that they're not going to do anything without you. They publicly said that there's going to be well, no Well, they tried more. it with another lead singer once, didn't they? So, it didn't uh, work. <laughs> that didn't really work. I did send him my best wishes, actually, and say good luck. Would you, if asked in the future, could you see that a reunion? No, no too no. much now. It's um, the, the the thing is with me. If, if you if you take it too far, once I say no, that's it. Yeah. And once I once I've gone, I've gone. I think it's sad. I think it's sad for the fans. I, I wish a journalist would actually ask them why I left because yeah. they've never been honest in any interview that they've ever done as to why I left, and it was very very specific. And as I've said, it's, it's not, it's not a you know, Spandau's not a band you just leave just on, a, oh, I've, I've had a bad day. It was a real, it really got to the point I just couldn't be there and do it any, you know, be a part of it anymore. So um, maybe, maybe a journalist will ask them one day. See well, if what, I see, ever see get what the they chance, say. If I ever get the chance, I will, and I'll let you know. Well, but just ask them to be honest, <laughs> and then may, maybe people will then realise um, exactly why I left. But until that point, I'm keeping it under my hat. And what, well, you mentioned earlier when we were talking about gold that a lot of yeah. people will not necessarily know who you are, but will know the song, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, students. But as soon as I announced to people that you were coming on the show, especially the guys here, 
Oh, really? God, can you ask about Lady C? You're C? far too young. You oh. ask about the jungle. And right, so okay. many people yeah, know yeah, yeah. So first of all, going back to I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, one of the biggest reality shows. It's loved in the Why UK. Why did I do it? Why did you do it? What made you say yes this time? Because you were asked previously. I was asked several times. Yes. So uh, we, we got together again, 214, 215, stand out. Soul Boys of the Western World, film, warts and all and everything else. That was a real... You know, it was a tough film to, to, to watch. George Hankin, she did a brilliant job as the director, really did. And, um, and we went on tour, and we had a great time, we had a lovely time. You know, but I, I think the guys wanted to continue it. And I said, well, look, I've done a year and a half. I've, I've done everything you've asked me to do, and I've had a great time. But I've got my own band, right? fabulous TH band, and we're all great friends, we've got young kids and stuff. Yeah. And, and they've been hanging around for me, and I owe them as well. I've been a solo artist for longer than I was ever in Spandau for. So um, I had an album to finish, Talking to the Moon, and, uh, and then the I'm a Celebrity Jungle thingamabob come up again. <laughs> and I thought, Phew, what, do I do, what do I do here? And I thought, actually, um, this is prime time ITV. I've been in the jungle for real. I know I love the jungle. It's three and a half weeks, the family's in the Versace drinking white wine and having a good time. It's a TV show, just do it. And, and, and what it did was amazing and sort of, you know, connected with some younger people as well who didn't necessarily know who TH was. But as soon as it was the true and the gold was identified, oh, right, yeah. you're the bloke, then you know what I <laughs> And so, so I, got, I got a lot of younger people. I mean, I remember I came out of it and there was a bunch of about 20, um, 20 year olds on a stag weekend in Amsterdam. I was like, and they go, oh, Tone. So it did, it did its job. But unfortunately for you, uh, you were in there with someone that was quite hard work. In oh, the yeah, name yeah, of, yeah. Uh, Lady C, who just didn't take to you. And it looked really uncomfortable. I mean, we only see 60 minutes of 24 hours. Now, yeah. I couldn't imagine living in the jungle. Why do you think you, uh, you just clashed? What was it about you that just really got to her? She, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean, when we went in, I, 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 gave, I gave her my bed. Uh, I slept on the floor. I was happy to sleep on the floor with the spiders and rats and everything Ooh. else. And uh, I found that actually after I had a cameraman that had a, it was on me 24-7 for spiders and rats Ooh. and snakes and things like that. Because I, I sleep pretty starfish, you know, so I don't, I don't lock it all up. <laughs> and, uh, and so I didn't realise that until I, I came out. Um, we just... Did, I don't know, we just didn't connect. You know, when we went in, I was, I was kind of trying to be, oh, you know, let's sit down, you take it easy, we'll, yeah. take, we'll take this over and everything else. And um, anyway, it just all went completely pear-shaped and um, there were many times I'd walk into the jungle, count a 10, and then calmly walk back in again. <laughs> it was when you were called a buffoon. It's just I will watch clips back on YouTube because it came out of nowhere. Um, but one thing I want to uh, quickly do is, I mean, actually, I thought this would be difficult for you, but you've yeah. proved today your knowledge on your own career is very good. So I've got some questions, oh, which are all gosh. about you, Span right. now. Uh, Ten questions. We're going to see yeah. how many you can get right. Go on, then. Um, so you played Tom Marshall in which TV show? Oh, that'd be the family, uh, what was it, uh, oh, what's it called? That American TV show, Modern Family. I got down to earth. Oh. <laughs> oh, God, no, I'm not that the good. Wrong show. Oh, down to earth. Yeah. Do you know, I've forgotten if he'd even done you that. You did that. Wow. Um, there you go, shows how good my memory is. What position did you finish in on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here? I was five, I think. Six. There's a six. Yeah, there very close. Uh, through the barricades uh, reached which number in the UK charts? Number six. Correct. How yeah. many Brit Awards did Spandau Ballet win? One for technical Correct. excellence in 1984. What a rubbish award that was. <laughs> so. um, you won the TV show Reborn in the USA. I did. Um, I didn't even get a caravan. Not a, <laughs> not a caravan, not a car, not a sausage. But can you name any of your fellow singers, contestants that were also on the show with you? Duncan Bannatyne. Great. Reborn in the USA. Oh, Reborn in the USA. <laughs> it's, it's been a long day. It's been, I've only been on the road for about six days. I've got, I've got fog of it. Uh, Reborn in the USA. Ah, oh, Lee John, Pete Cox, uh, Elkie Brooks. Um, oh. 
Oh. Is somebody helping you? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting help. Oh, uh, um, oh, there was there was so many. In our so you had uh, oh, uh, Mark Shaw. Yeah. Jericho. Uh, Dollar. Gina, Dollar. Yeah, yeah. Gina G. Gina Sonia. G. Um, you oh, had Sonia. Peter yeah. Cox. Um, Michelle Gale. Michelle. Oh yeah. So yeah, she came second. She was interesting. Anyway. <laughs> Um, what three tracks did uh, you sing at Live Aid? Uh, true. <laughs> true. Only when you leave. And ridiculously, a new song called Virgin. Yes, correct. I've um, never watched it. I've never watched it since. So the next one is, which uh, Spandau Ballet song features the line, listening to Marvin all night long? I got that one true. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was <laughs> looking at something else here. Um, oh, who's, on tour, <laughs> who's got tour fog? True <laughs> is on the soundtrack of which Adam Sandler film? Oh, The Wedding Singer. Why have I got 50 first dates? Was it on The Wedding Singer? According and to... And 50 first dates, yeah. You got two of them. I think it was two. Um, the and then the next one is True spent how many weeks at number one in the UK charts? Four. Correct. And this is really impressive. The next one is which song did True knock off the top, uh, knock off the top spot? So what song did you knock off to become number one? You probably know this. No, it's really impressive. Do you know this? Right, hold on. Give me a second. Give me a second. <laughs> Let me go back in the archives. Um, it wasn't Rene and Renata, but it was something <laughs> <laughs> Charles and Dave. No, it, David Bowie, Let's Dance. Was it really? Yeah. And when well, you look at that now, that's incredible. <clears throat> well, that's not bad, is it? I'm, I'm, so, I'm really like, good. Bowie, there's another hero of mine that I met, and uh, incredible, incredible. Um, so, well, you've done in, incredibly well. Um, that was appalling. Actually. <laughs> that was appalling. <laughs> Is, uh, I should have known every, every one of those. But thank you so much for saying. Like, what I do want to uh, quickly ask you is you mentioned you're working on a, a new album yeah. uh, now. So what can we expect from that? Because I guess with lockdown, you've got a lot of time to really work on some material. Is, is the well, if, if I'm honest, I only got two, two vocals done. Uh, obvious was the song that we released in, in the yeah. summer, last summer. You know, kind of about being together. My, my daughter filmed it in her back. Really? In the back courtyard. She filmed it and then Paul Green put all the sort of montage together it's like a coke advert so it's about being together we need to be together yeah. we don't want to all be separate and locked away and so it's a real kind of happy song and um then because of you which is a single out now i managed to get a vocal on that the 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 rest of it is in different different stages some of them got vocals on but we've not mixed them um but there's there's a few that i haven't quite finished lyrically and i need to vocalize as well so with luck and do that type wood thing again. Um, Autumnish. That's when we can expect it. Well, sort of. <laughs> from now, people can watch you. Uh, you're all over the country. We're going to put the in the link below. You can click and look at the dates uh, and buy tickets because it's going to be a fantastic show. Forty years put into a is it two hour show? Well, it's actually about forty two years. If you if you if you take it from when we first started, it's forty six years. When so, we were yeah, sixteen long, at school. So it's a long That's time. A long, it's a long time. But listen, I'm still like a kid in a sweet shop. I'm still enjoying myself. I should have really put. I should have dressed up. You look shirt. smart. It's a really nice shirt. It's it's well, it's a it's a nice Italian, Italian yeah. jacket. So but thank, thank you, you so much we for coming back on the smart. show. It's been incredible having and to actually meet you this time and not have the technical no, issues you. where you're Thanks. on mute. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Man. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you.